Um, I just bumped into Graham Taylor. I'm here in Shimoyo at the moment. And he was telling me about his walk through after he had to abandon his car. The extent of destruction outside of Baira, in the small little villages like Muffinbees and the Shinga and places like that in between. He said in a four kilometer stretch, he saw between three to 500 dead bodies washed up against the road and people who were still alive just being taken with the rapid. Graham reckoned in that village alone there was a thousand dead. He was able to stay on the road where the water wasn't too bad and he said all through the night you could hear people screaming and crying and splashing in the water because it's full of crocodiles as well. So, you know, you fall out of a tree, you get chomped by the croc. I mean, like, these people have got no chance. Graham said in this village, there was one white guy who had one little boat and he had a 200 meter long rope and he would just tie this to a tree and rescue all the people from one tree and take them to higher ground and go to the next tree and go to the next building and go to the next hut. And Graham said he must have saved thousands of people and he didn't stop for three days. He says it's just a drop in the ocean. It was just this one guy in his boat. Um, yeah, it's just horrific. In March 2019, tropical cyclone Nidai hit the northern coastal Mozambican city of Baira, causing catastrophic damage across Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi. The storm left more than 1,000 people dead and thousands more missing. The South African relief aid agency Gift of the Givers were one of the first to respond. And you flew over what looked like an ocean and you saw tips of trees and you saw the tips of roofs of houses and people on top of these things. I think that's when it hit me how difficult this was going to be. There were people stranded, as I said, on holding on to trees in the, in the raging water, um, you know, getting cut, getting hurt while they're holding on because of the strength of the water. And the immediate need was to take these people, relocate them to an area of safety. You could not get to them by boat because of the strength of the flow of the rivers. You could not get to them by roads because they were destroyed. So the only way was a limiting resource of a helicopter. That's when we decided to hire our own helicopters. At the same time, they needed food. Kids needed baby milk. They needed clean drinking water. So they needed bottled water. And of course, injuries through falling debris, the roof sheeting hitting them, getting hit by rocks, trees, branches, all kinds of debris in the water and in the sea. They needed medical care. So those were the priorities. Water rescue, food, bottled water, medical care, and evacuation. So I was on the helicopters receiving the people that were being pulled out of these areas to assess them to make sure who needs to be medically triaged and uh, treated immediately. We have a team of 35. Thankfully, we did have paramedics who have medical training as well that could do that. It was them, and it was uh, off-road rescue, which is now a part of the Gift of the Givers team. These guys, they drive four by fours, and with them, they have, which was very, very helpful, they got their own communication systems with walkie-talkie, two-way radio. And if we did not have that, we would have been stranded. All the people that were rescued were then designated an area which was called Guara Guara, and we had close to 13,000 people there, majority with wounds on their legs because of all the debris and the, the flood-related injuries, a lot of them with sepsis, even small nicks had, because of the unfortunate environment, the flood waters, which are not hygienic, you know, decomposing bodies. The first day when I went to assess with the SNDF, they said to me, I have 30 minutes, they can take back three patients, and I need to triage and decide who needs medical evac. But there's 44 people in there that were rescued just that afternoon that needed to be assessed. And I think out of the first three I assessed, those were the three I needed to evac. And I'm thinking to myself, and I haven't even reached the others. So we assessed everyone, but you know, we had to only take three. One was a child with a fractured leg, um, but now the complication is she's not alone, she has to go with her mum. So that's two spaces gone. So we, we had to twist SNDF arm to allow us to take another two people. And then the second one was someone who had a severe cellulitis of his leg. He, interestingly enough, was surrounded by four kids. And I said to him, we need to evacuate. And he said, no. He said he, during the flood, was stuck in a tree for about three or four days. And during that time, he, was, he found four children. So they weren't his kids. They were either neighbors from the village, whatever the case is. But he says it's his responsibility now to look after these four kids and he can't leave them. And I couldn't take all of them. 
So he refused to be evac on his own. So what we ended up doing for him is uh, we sort of gave him intramuscular injections of antibiotics that we had, started him on medication, and thankfully he was mobile and doing much, much better the next few days. In this situation, nine out of the ten of the kids were very solemn, very traumatized. They wouldn't smile. God only knows what they've seen, what they've witnessed, what they've felt. Back at the operations center in Bramley, Johannesburg, the teams debrief, check and replenish equipment, and analyze the effectiveness of the mission. Always looking to learn from their most recent experiences, to be better prepared for the next mission. We dispatched a second medical team. When I got back, our second team that drove up from Vilankulos reached an area called Estaquina. And that's as far as they could go by road. And then they were working with boats. And they rescued over 2,000 people on boat. Uh, they would local farmers. They set up shelter, feeding programs. So they have over 6,500 people there. And that's an area that no other aid agency has been there. There's no other support. And I just got the news yesterday, which actually made me smile. Our obstetrician and gynecologist delivered their first baby in the middle of the bush. In the build-up to Cyclone Adai, heavy rains brought floods and devastation to both Malawi and Zimbabwe. So we can see that this is the in Malawi, gift of the givers flew in roof sheeting, bottled water, mosquito nets, clothes and food items, while the South African National Defence Force brought in medical teams. In Zimbabwe, gift of the givers flew in sniffer dogs. In Zimbabwe itself, they said, they want people to come with sniffer dogs because in an area, almost 300 people are missing in one area, 39 school children and their teachers in another area. And they actually want closure. They want us to point out, not to dig, point out where the possible sites are that the bodies could be found. And then they would do the digging themselves in that area. And we sent the teams and there the corporation came with the South African police services. They spoke to the minister's office and sent his six people, four dog handlers, and two other people that I asked for. And of course, Oro gave us two communication specialists again, and we had our own teams. So we sent a team of 12, that people were extremely grateful that somebody was coming to try to identify where their loved ones could be. Over the years, we've built up a, a database of, of volunteers, extremely diverse. When we went to Syria, our team was 60 odd strong, and I was chatting to one of the locals. He looked at me and he said, he understood I was Muslim as well, and he said to me, no, I can understand why you have come all the way across the world, it's a Muslim country, I can understand. And then he looked at Jennifer, who was a uh, blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl from Cape Town, and she's standing next to me and he said, but I don't understand why you are here. So very diverse, all complete volunteers, uh, unpaid for their services. They basically take time off work to be able to assist when they can. Mother of three, Kim Williams is an advanced life support paramedic who has worked in the Johannesburg region of the emergency response services for 29 years. Johannesburg EMS has a close working relationship with Gift of the Givers. And in 2015, with the earthquake in Nepal, Kim answered the call. It was just that deep-rooted feeling that our own camaraderie that we need to group together as South Africans and go and help other human beings who were in, a, in dire, dire straits and needed our, our expertise. When we went out into the wilderness, into the mountains, that is where you could see absolute catastrophic decimation where uh, entire villages have been wiped out from the landslides and you would see perhaps one elderly person sitting on the on the pile trying to dig through to try and perhaps find a loved one. Um, you would see dogs and being a dog lover it was quite sad for me to see the dogs sitting on the pile because somebody that they knew was underneath there and they could still um, uh, sense it. You could see a lot of naked bodies floating down the river. The, the, the villagers would find people that had died and they would didn't know who they are they would address them and then put them in the rivers to float down the rivers. One day you're cleaning toilets um, another day you are chopping up uh, food and you're going to cook a meal another day you're digging bodies out another day you're going to help assist with search and rescue another time you're feeding people another time you're helping the dentist with his work 
Um, another time you're in theatre helping the surgeons and assisting them. It's a wonderful organisation and Dr. Suleiman is a very humble individual. He's a very spiritual individual, God is in the centre of his life. And even though um, I'm, I'm Catholic, and there were quite a few Catholic, there were in Khekak, the Hindu, there was quite a multi-culture of, of religions within um, our rescue team. Everybody understood and we could each practice whatever we, we felt like and share and, and pray individually or pray as a group. Um, that, that for me was really, it was really wonderful. We are multicultural. Many of us had different accents, yet we were South African. We looked different, but we were South African. And we were all united in our green and our, and our, and our, and our badge. There was a little girl with her brother and we were handing out food. She'd lost her mother and she had lost her aunt in the earthquake. They were the only two um, to survive. And she was patiently waiting in the queues for her food. And she sat down and her brother had broken his arm. And she was telling us about her dreams and her aspirations and how excited she was that we were there and that everything was going to be okay. And what really hit me was that this little girl had been, you could see through her eyes, she'd been through so much trauma, but she still was able to see hope. And she was so grateful for the little that we did for her. I think in situations like that, you'd like to save everyone. And you have to realize when you're there. Um, if, I always work on Mother Teresa when she says, if you, if you can't feed a hundred, feed one. And if you can save or make a difference or bring closure to one human being there, it was worth a while. The first mission I went with was to Gaza in 2009. I just heard by accident, uh, one of my colleagues was speaking about it and I heard about it on the radio. And then I decided, ah, this is what I really want to do. This is why I studied what I did. My family is open to what you want to do in life. So if you choose to do something, they'd support you. So they were supportive of me going. There was no medical organizations or NGOs in Gaza and the Rafa border was closed, the border between Egypt and Gaza. It was completely shocking, I mean people were living just on what they had in Gaza, you know. The border countries were not allowing things into the country and out of the country. For me it was, was a real eye-opening experience, um, you know, I, I didn't expect the level of uh, devastation to be what it was. From the minute we got in, we just saw buildings that were smashed to pieces, like whole, whole neighborhoods were in rubble. They had no medical equipment, no medical instruments. Simple operations couldn't be done in the hospital because they had no equipment. I covered some of the work that some of the uh, Gift of the Givers team had been doing. I remember covering the work in particular of some child psychologists that they brought with who were offering sort of counselling, like trauma counselling for children who had seen some of these um, really horrific events. And I can remember them asking the kids to draw pictures and, and often the pictures that they were drawing were showing bombs falling down, uh, tanks, people bleeding, things like that. It was um, quite tough to see the trauma that these kids had been going through. Whatever operation came in that was the most uh, severe and needed to be operated on first would be operated on and whatever instrumentation and machinery we took and, and we were capable of helping with that operation, we would do it. There was one uh, young man about 17 or 18 years old and he'd actually been injured by a phosphorus bomb and really terrible injuries. So what happens is when phosphorus goes into, you, into your body and uh, the wound heals up, then it, it's fine. But as soon as it's opened, like it burns when it's exposed to oxygen. So, you know, whenever, and there were lots of little um, fragments of this in this guy's body, and it caused devastating burns to him. I remember one of his eyes was uh, seriously burnt as well. And the, the one person that stood out was this little four-year-old boy who needed his kidney taken out, which was diseased, and he couldn't, they couldn't do it because they had no capabilities. So the South African doctors could help, and there was an American transplant surgeon, and he had waited for three years for this operation. And all of a sudden, here was a team that could say, hey, we can help with this. 
we did the operation and uh, like seeing his parents face and his face and we saw him two days after that and he healed amazingly and he was just like a normal little boy playing who had this opportunity to be operated on and we had this opportunity to help him. If you were standing out and looking, someone would have to ask who's Dr. Suleiman in this group. He's very much part of the team, but he's so unassuming. You know, you just, he's there, but he's not there. He'd ask everyone, have you eaten? Have you done something? Have you gone to the hospital? What did you do? Every night he'd have like a debrief. And on a personal level with everyone, he would know how everyone's doing on the trip. So it's a good camaraderie between the team. The whole suburb had been devastated, completely flattened. People had lost everything, including family members. And I remember seeing uh, on one heap of rubble, it used to be someone's house, there was a small little uh, makeshift tent had been erected. And uh, a family was under there, they had a small fire going. And I was just blown away when this family just called over to me and uh, invited me over and said, please come join us, have tea have tea with us, you know, and to see that sort of humanity despite, um, you know, this severe situation that they found themselves in was, was really heartwarming. The search and rescue had gone ahead and uh, they were involved in that, but a lot of uh, the, the difficulty with Haiti is we forget it's a third world country. So you don't just have a massive disaster, you have a massive disaster in a population that are malnourished, that are anemic, that have no antibiotics, that have no running water. So often you think you just go there and fix bones and save lives. It doesn't happen like that. There's no blood, there's no resources. You can't operate without blood. Patients are very nutritionally depleted. So the risks of wound infection are higher, the recovery rates are lower, the risks of wound breakdown is lower. So Haiti was difficult from that perspective. Haiti for me was um, probably one of the most traumatic, um, you know, things that I've, uh, that I've covered. From the minute the plane landed and the door opened, you could smell rotting flesh, like, immediately. Up to 300,000 people had been killed in this one earthquake. And every day you would see dead bodies on the street. There was no infrastructure. Um, people weren't able to work or earn money. And as a result, people were looting and the police were opening fire with live ammunition on people. It wouldn't be unheard of. I mean, I did see a, a dog running in the street with a, with a human hand in its mouth. All the time it was it was complete uh, hell on earth. When this earthquake happened, it happened in the afternoon, and the university with all the educated part of the population, the office blocks with all the economically active part of the population, crushed with all these people in it. They lost a large part of their economically active and youth part of their population. We treated a lot of kids whose entire families were destroyed, no parents. We treated parents who begged us to bring their children back to South Africa because they knew there's no future there. The hospitals were destroyed by the earthquake. So there was a semi erect structure that we had found and when we went, there were other countries offering aid. Intias had also taken kind of a mobile theater. It's almost like a tent that you blow up with appropriate ventilation and the appropriate machinery. We kind of just fitted in with the people that were there. Uh, brought our resources to add on to their resources and what we found is being South African and being trained where we train we have vast experience in mass trauma and multiple trauma so for us um, uh, you know it was easier to fit in with the other doctors and help them along because most of the first world countries that offer aid were not used to mass disasters like this so it is a matter of just going in with the resources and trying to assist where you could Intias always does his best to ensure safety, ensure your security. Syria was a war zone. All the hospitals are destroyed. We went to Dakush. And 
What MTS had done was he had converted a home into a hospital. So it's not a simple thing of saying let's bring equipment. He had to get piped oxygen, appropriate lighting, tile. It still needed to have minimum standards for you to be able to treat and operate. And that hospital had been functioning with one doctor who worked 24 seven for over two years. And he was a cardiothoracic surgeon and he did everything from gynae to pediatrics, literally was working every day of his life because a lot of the doctors had fled the country. So we took more equipment and MTRs had built it up to the point that they had kind of two theaters that were functional. They had a mobile x-ray machine, they had a lab that could do basic bloods and the locals would come in and donate their own blood so we could transfuse patients. So there were guys coming in with gunshot wounds and little kids that were hurt and injured. And, and there were also patients that were coming in because they've also never had medical care. So maybe someone had a tumor or someone had an injury they could never get operated on. Most of the casualties we saw were women and children. We saw patients come in with injuries as a result of chemical weapons. So it was, uh, I mean, MTS was just doing amazing work there. We were the first aid that had gone to Syria and that war was going on more than two years. And the, the local people were so grateful. You know, what they said to us is that most of us on the team are not Muslim in their Muslim country. And you get a tiny country in Africa where most of the team are not even Muslim coming to aid a Muslim country. So they were so grateful that we came. At one time there was these guys stormed the hospital and there was gunfire in the hospital. But we were operating at that moment and um, it was, a, it, it was a, a little child and I was, I'm not leaving this child here, we can't go. And, and these guys were talking in Arabic and yes, we are going, you can't, it's fine, we will sort it out. And then I said, no, 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 we're taking the child with us. So eventually we took the child with us and the child's mom and we went out to the back of the hospital. And I think that was a very profound moment for me. I, I cried more, but when I came home, not at that moment, it was sorted out between the locals and gift and then we went back to work the next day as though nothing had happened. Imtiaz is always there, he's with us all the time. And he always says, if anyone is unhappy or feeling unsafe, he will get you back home immediately. But with MTS there, there's never a time you don't feel safe. He's always there, he's with us, and he always says, it's voluntary, nobody will judge you if you leave early. So he always say, you're feeling stressed, you need to leave, you leave straight away, but nobody leaves. In any mission, when you leave, you, we actually go to Dr. MTS and we say, can't we stay another week? Can't we stay another day? Uh, we can do one more operation and that's what we did. We had to cross the river in like a drum so they put like a few people in the drum and these guys pull you across the river into Turkey. So four or five people would go and myself and one of the surgeons and one of the anaesthetists were like no we can still do so many more operations everyone else must go everyone else must go and eventually they were like you guys are the last ones now you have to cross and we said, no, one more, just one more operation. And um, we were, that was the last, last moment. In fact, I just left my backpack there. For Gift of the Givers volunteers, the commitment and compassion shown on international missions is an extension of their dedication to serving their communities back home. I come away with an inner feeling of, of gratification and inner feeling of peace. It's very strange. I think um, when we got back from Syria, I spoke to my mom, my family, my wife, my kids. They stressed. And when you get back and you realize the level of stress and concern they had, and you look back at yourself, in that two weeks I was in Syria, I never felt unsafe. I mean, the place we used to have our breakfast was actually hit during the day that we weren't there. So there is that real threat, but you don't feel that uneasiness because you feel you're giving off to a greater good and you're assisting people who really need it without any financial gain, without any other gain, except you're doing it purely to serve mankind. I think for me that creates that inner peace. On the 25th of November, 2011, 36-year-old South African Stephen McGarth 
was kidnapped by Al-Qaeda terrorists in Timbuktu. Newly married, Stephen was motorbiking from London back home to Johannesburg. Abducted, he was held hostage in the deserts of Mali for six years. My plan was not to be a hero ever. What I told my family was that if I ever encounter problems, I, I will just leave everything and leave. In essence, we had just been for a walk around Timbuktu, myself and some other tourists. I was sitting with my phone, typing up a bit of a, a diary. It was during the Friday prayer, there, so the streets were empty. They walked in, three guys, and basically took us out one by one into the street, um, cuffed us, loaded us up in the back of a 4x4. They pulled a, a cargo net over us, so we were unable to move, and then we zoomed out into the desert. I was sitting in my office on a Saturday morning and I get this phone call at 8 o'clock in the morning and it's from the lady in Holland that he was riding with her son. And when she introduced herself, I said, don't tell me this is bad news. She said, I'm afraid so. That's the first we heard. It was a shattering news, as you can imagine. Some 18 months later, in May 2013, Pierre and Yolanda Korki were abducted by Al-Qaeda terrorists in Yemen. At the time, they had been resident with their two young children in the southern town of Tyres for some four years. Pierre taught English, and Yolanda ran grassroots projects in the local community. Then came war. As the situation deteriorated, the Korkis found themselves trapped, waiting for their passports to be renewed by the Yemen authorities. With a lot of help and, and support from our Yemeni friends, we've managed to finally get our passports extracted from the government system. And we were actually that afternoon, we just left the house to go and collect the passports with the exit visas. And Lisa Marie, our daughter, was 14 at the time. She was going to come with us, but she stayed behind with our son. Pierre was a very hands-on um, father. There were always hugs and, and kisses being exchanged, so those were part of the last few moments. And we left the house. Um, and that was the last time Pierre saw, held, spoke, knew anything about his children. That first morning, I phoned all over, them, every number in Pretoria from the government side, I know governments don't pay, but whatever the ransom figure was, <laughs> I want my son home. And I think I said to every minister I met, have you got children? Put yourself in my shoes. What would you do if your son or daughter, whatever, was taken? So I was doing what any father would do. When my car door, I was a passenger, was yanked open, I think the realization that something was going wrong hit us. I was dragged across the road. I looked back. Pierre had a gun to his head and within the next few seconds Pierre was also yanked out of the car and brought and we were bundled into the car. There were guys all over the place. The car was full to capacity and we went off. We were being kidnapped but our attention turned to our children and, and what were they going through. Would they be safe? Would they harm them? What would they do with them? You're incarcerated, so your humaneness is, you're stripped of your humaneness and you start to go into introspection, um, worry about the children, and we had no contact. We tried desperately several times, every day if we could, we tried to, to initiate a conversation to get contact with them, but we were not allowed. It wasn't allowed. But mostly, Pierre, I, 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 I cannot imagine if I would have made it without him being there. He managed to keep us to a sort of a routine when, when we could. We tried to just divide our day. Now you're living without a clock, so you've got to try and manage the time. Sometimes you wouldn't know whether it was day or, or, or night, depending on where they kept you. Um, just to keep going, you know, to spend time in prayer, talking, singing, rubbing each other's backs, going back to the same routine. By 2013, 
Through their ongoing relief campaign, Gift of the Givers had established a significant profile in Yemen. Becoming aware of the Corky's abduction, Dr. Suleiman and Anas Hamatin, Gift's representative in Yemen, decided to escalate the campaign, thereby raising their profile and building further goodwill. Our advantage is we have a profile in Yemen. People know who we are. What we can do is we'll send more supplies, more goods. And I started increasing the amount of stuff we started sending into Yemen to build goodwill with everybody. And we said, hopefully, maybe it'll soften somebody's heart and say, look, South Africans helping us. Why we took a South African? Pierre was very, very sick at that time. He woke up one morning and he could not hear anything. He was completely 100% deaf. It was very traumatic um, time for us. And then the Sheikh came and said, we were going to be released. On the night of the 9th, um, they woke us up in the middle of the night somewhere. They pulled us out of the room next door into their side and uh, they pushed down Pia on the floor and they said I was going first and I said no, no, well, there's a mistake, there's a mistake, we're going together. The Sheikh had said we're going together. Pia jumped up, he couldn't hear, he was trying to ask what's going on, what's going on. It was a confusing, um, horrendous few seconds. Uh, we, 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 we were holding each other, trying to make sense of what was going on, and they tried to calm us down, but they, then they separated us forcefully. And the last thing Pia said was, if you see the children before I see them, tell them I love them and, and I love you. And whew, Even though I was released, I was still a hostage. My heart had stayed behind almost in Yemen, so I was sort of living on two continents and, and lots of things went wrong. It was a horrendous, tumultuous 11 months that followed and, and that's the one thing I, I have so much appreciation for with, for MTS and for Anas is they were 100% accessible. They were not at all phased if I wanted to talk at 2 in the morning. They were available to hear my fears. They were available to give me, to encourage the children and myself. They kept having hope and they kept trying to find a channel or a way to continue with, with negotiations for Pierre. It took us a long time. We had to use tribal leaders who met tribal leaders who met tribal leaders. And over the period of time, the tribal leaders eventually, on our behalf, sort of pressurized Al-Qaeda to say, look, you're passing all our lands all the time. And I kept on sending in more supplies. The South Africans have brought in so much goods, this one we have to look the other way. So at 5.59 on the morning of 6th December 2014, I tell Yolandi a message. I said, Yolandi, the wait is finally over. He is coming back home. I, I, um, I got ready got dressed, washed my hair, maybe today was the day that I would be able to fly and be, have, you know, be reunited with Pia. And then I got a call from uh, Colonel Aaron Stradum, um, with the FBI on the other side as well, stating that the Americans had gone in to uh, launch a second uh, rescue operation for the American hostage Luke Summers. And uh, they were um, discovered before they had executed the complete rescue operation, apparently. And out of revenge, uh, the captors then went in and killed Pia and uh, Luke. That was the most difficult thing, to, you know, for me to eventually tell Yolandi. But she was gracious. She said, look, I'm not blaming anybody. I forgive everybody. Nothing is going to bring Pierre back. You can't have hate, you can't have anger. It's not going to bring Pierre Cocky back. And she said, Pierre Cocky was the kind of guy who would say, you know what, forget everything, forgive everybody, let things lie and go forward. So I have to be what Pierre would want me to be. And that's what I'm going to be now. And that's how it ended. Feeling totally abandoned, held hostage for almost four years, in June 2015, Stephen McGowan, under the instruction and supervision of his Al-Qaeda captors, made a proof of life video, which was posted on social media. June 2015, for some strange reason, the TV was on my house in the morning, and suddenly I see this video of Stephen McGowan. It's like God put the TV on for me. 
And I said, this is Stephen Madhavan. And he's showing the pictures and the way the video is talking. I said to me, these guys want to negotiate. I phoned Malcolm, I said, Malcolm, I'm taking this case off for you. These guys want to talk. This video is telling me that very, very clearly. We'll work the mechanics out afterwards, but yes, I'm going to help you now. Because these guys are going to talk, let's not lose the opportunity. I heard about Gift of the Givers in, I think it was around October in 2014. Um, some guys drove into our camp and they said to me, there is a South African Muslim organization who are now going to negotiate your release. And then they turned to the Swedish guy and said, and they're going to negotiate yours as well. And this process took over two years. I involved the South African government. The South African government involved the Swedish government. We told them the channels, what to do, how it has to be done. We got all the information for them. Eventually, Al-Qaeda sent a message. You've done your job. You've got your government to speak to the Mali government. You've got your government to speak to state security. You've got, you spoke to our intermediary. Again, all that message is coming to the intermediary. We've sent you the videos. They're both alive. Now, you have to pull back. Beyond this point, you as an NGO cannot go. In July 2017, after six years of captivity in the desert wilderness of Mali, Stephen McGowan was released by his Al-Qaeda captors and arrived back home in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's the biggest surprise day of my life. I looked out and there's this big Land Rover with two big guys in it and, uh, you know, I opened up, let them in and they said, no, they've got no news. My heart sunk. They said they're waiting for a phone call. And eventually I said to them, you know, I said, if Stephen is coming back, I just want, please, that you tell, I don't want him to arrive off the plane to give Kath a hug, to give me a hug and then say, where's mom? I said, they must disclose to him that his mother's passed away. Yeah, I had many questions the previous evening asking what I was going home to, that I have a wife, that I have a family. And well, you can imagine. So, you know, another two, I think Land Rovers arrived with this big black Mercedes. And, and out jumped Steve fully clothed as he lived in the desert. And uh, my father was the first, first, first guy I saw. He walked out, gave me a big hug, and there was lots of tears, and uh, yeah, quite like an emotional overload, if you like. Um, obviously, my mom passed away. There were certain topics we didn't discuss the first, yeah, at, at the time, but it was, I suppose, six years of questions and emotion squeezed into a moment, a, a 10 second moment when I saw my father. It was, it was quite overwhelming. I felt fantastic on the one hand, but very sad on the other. We were a month too late for him to see his mother. We didn't succeed in getting him out for his mother to see him or for him to see his brother. That was the very sad part for us. In June 2017, the fires that ravaged the sedgefield meisner plettenberg Bay area, forcing some 10,000 people to flee their homes, saw Gift of the Givers mobilizing one of their biggest interventions ever. It was a massive a fire. It affected rich and poor. We sent in our own fire teams to assist the existing fire people if necessary. We sent in medical teams. We sent in medical equipment. We sent in medical supplies. We sent in the food parcels, the blankets, the hygiene packs, the, you know, the whatever, and, and the linen, towels, the, all that was required for the different areas. Oh, oh, the other thing, we fed the firemen. 1,200 firemen twice a day. We provided bottled water, energy, juice, high energy biscuits, snacks, and, and, at, and at some point in the week, we provided hot meals for them. Pet food for domestic cats and dogs. Fodder for animals in the wild, and the elephants of the Neisner Forest. A truckload of sugar donated to resuscitate the bee population. No request was too big or too small for Dr. Suleiman's immediate attention. Next came Sutherland, devastated by the worst drought experienced in decades. Mobilizing trains made available by Transnet 
Between August and December 2017, Dr. Suleiman shipped 48 million rands worth of fodder donated by farmers across the country into the region. Sutherland was a serious trouble. All the balls have dried up. Secondly, because of the drought, there was no fodder to feed the animals. The sheep count before the drought was 400,000. It's now 57,000. Farmers were closing down. And in the area itself, some farmers killed themselves because of depression. We then went in, we started drilling boreholes. Out of the 208, we only have 14 more to do. And then we are now providing pumps and solar panels, the diesel we use, the farmers have contributed to some extent, but by fine large it's outside donations to try to help them to get on their own feet. One day they'll contribute you know, in some other way or put it forward, it doesn't matter. The drought intensified. Gift of the Givers responded, bringing relief to 63 areas in the Northern Cape, 15 in the Eastern and 8 in the Western Cape. So all those areas required either bottled water or fodder or boreholes, you know, and then the farmers lost their jobs, so they needed food aid, and so other people needed clothes, in winter they needed blankets. So the intervention started off with one bowl, one truck of bottled water, and the whole project actually, including Sutherland 2017 August, till now the drought intervention has cost us close to 200 million. With Christmas approaching, Gift of the Givers hold a Santa Goes Green party for underprivileged children and their families in Johannesburg. That evening, a devastating fire destroys the homes and possessions of some 500 shack-dwelling families in the community of Alexandra Township. With food, water and emergency shelter, Gift of the Givers are one of the first to respond, bringing relief to the devastated community. Through their One Man Can campaign, Gift of the Givers enables South Africans to assist with the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. 32 containers, 500 tons of food, bottled water and medical supplies make their way by road to Durban from where they are shipped across the ocean to the port of Aden in southern Yemen. Commemorating the birthday of Prophet Muhammad on Saturday, December the 8th, Gift of the Givers bring hope, joy and comfort, feeding some 4,000 people from the community of New Clare and Westbury. In August 1991, Dr. Imtiaz Suleiman was traveling in Turkey when he happened upon a mosque where a religious teacher was holding a very special service. There were Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, people who say they're atheists, people from different countries, different backgrounds, different social strata, all in the same place. What I loved about it, there was harmony between the different groups. No friction, no discord, respect for each other's opinion, respect for each other's religious beliefs or no beliefs at all. Respect for just life in general. I looked at this, I said, yeah, well, this is a perfect world in one room. I hope this could be played out in the bigger world The 6.2 billion, billion people could have what I see here in such diverse ways with no friction, if only this was possible. Moved by this experience, the following year, Dr. Suleiman took a pilgrimage back to the mosque to attend another service given by the religious teacher. It was the 6th of August, 1992, and after the chanting of the zikra, the teacher looked directly at Imtiaz and addressed him. And he says in fluent Turkish, my son, I'm not asking you. I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Wakful Waqifin. Translated, it means gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, of all religions, of all colors, of all classes, of all cultures, of any geographical location and of any political affiliation. He then went on to say in Arabic, Khairun Nas, May and Faun Nas. Best among people are those who benefit mankind. He said, listen to this carefully. I said, best among people are those who benefit mankind, not Muslim, not Arab, not Indian. All people, all religion, all color, whether they believe or not is irrelevant. You are not to judge. You do what you have to do and you serve unconditionally. 
I think it goes back to why I became a surgeon. We spend a lot of our lives taking, taking, and um, not realizing that there's so much we can give. And Gift of the Givers is an organization where it doesn't matter if I'm contributing my time, my resources, or my finances. I know everything I give goes to help many, many, many people. So it's an opportunity to be a part of something bigger. You know, I, I grew up in a house that it was just normal to help your neighbor or to help someone. It wasn't even a question. If someone was hungry at school, you'd share your lunch. If you knew your neighbor was going through a hard time, you'd help your neighbor. So it was just like a natural progression of my, my values in life. Yes, I'm blessed. Um, my relationship with Gift of the Givers, um, with MTS, and also with Anas have continued. We often engage, because I'm at the University of the Free State, we often engage with our support from Gift of the Givers to support some of our students um, with uh, food parcels. When he's busy with other hostage negotiations, then if there's a need for the family to have some support, I'm, I'm always happy to come alongside uh, MTS and support what he's doing for that family because I know what it feels like. They're a wonderful organization. You know, Imtiaz, you talk to him, he's a real human being. He went to Mecca. He had someone who guided him, mentor, whatever. I suppose a holy man who told him what his calling is. And he's got good people involved there. Just look around our own country, the, job, the work that he does. If there's any disaster anywhere, he's there, that organization is the first one in there. I don't know how he does it. You get successes, is by the grace of God Almighty. You get failures, 